Hello and welcome to Parenting Stuff I Wish I Knew Sooner and I Want You to Know Now. I'm your host, Erica Desper, founder of the Center for Confident Parenting and a mom who seems to learn everything I need to know the hard way. I am joined today by Carrie Carpenter, owner and primary interventionist at Joyful Connections, mentoring and advocacy for the neurodiverse family. Carrie is the proud mama of two neurodiverse kiddos and has over 20 years of experience working as an occupational therapy practitioner in early intervention, autistic support, and parent coaching models by providing encouragement, education, and resources in both home and community settings. The Joyful Connections approach focuses on those daily tasks and activities that can be challenging for families who are managing developmental and behavioral concerns. I know all about it on a personal <laughs> level. Carrie, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Awesome. So first, just tell us a little bit about yourself and how and why you came to offer families this type of support. Sure. So uh, my background is uh, I'm an occupational therapy assistant. Started about 23 years ago, I worked with Easter Seals doing early intervention. And um, I learned a little bit about a specific type of model called the transdisciplinary model. And the Easter Seals in Delaware, where I worked, were um, real pioneers in this TD, transdisciplinary or TD model. And using this approach, um, you became more of a family coach than um, specific to your discipline, doing like mm -hmm. a specific therapy. So there would be one primary TD therapist, and there would be um, the PT, the speech, the early child educator, behaviorist would all consult with that TD therapist. And then um, you would develop a relationship with the family and become the primary therapist who worked on all of the goals while the other therapy disciplines would consult with you. So that um, working in that setting, working in family homes, developing family coaching, we had to do a lot of training on family coaching, on working within the, the home-based routines, um, that really stayed with me. I did that for the first 10 years of my career. And then when I moved up to Pennsylvania, I started working in the school district as mm -hmm. an independent contractor. And I worked in several different school districts. And I noticed that um, all of that experience, that coaching experience um, really stayed with me. And I came into the classrooms wanting to um, connect with the teachers, wanting to connect with the other disciplines in the same way that I did using that TD model. And it didn't always, um, didn't always go how I would expect. I think people were very uh, compartmentalized in the school system. Each person was very specific to their discipline. Um, they kind of stayed in their lane and there wasn't too much interdisciplinary collaboration. And so mm -hmm. I, um, I, I worked on that. I worked on that professionally. I worked on that and how I communicated with the teachers at IEP meetings. I was often the one asking the family, hey, what are you seeing at home? You know, what, um, what are your concerns? And then kind of facilitating communication with the teachers and the family. Um, and so I started to develop that skill set more and more of like, gosh, this is really me. I'm kind of more of a, a coach or a facilitator. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and that really stayed with me. And then I became a mom. And then. <laughs> and that is when and, we all and, pivot. And that is when, yes. And then um, once I had my own two children, um, I had to develop an entirely different set of skills, of course. Mm. And even with all that clinical experience um, behind me, it was, it's different when they're yours, right? It's, it's very so different. different. And. And both of my children, um, you know, had struggles early on, and I knew intuitively that there were some um, neuro differences going on with both my kids. And I really had to become a super strong advocate um, for both of them, and I still am. Mm -hmm. And so it's very interesting after so many years being on the other side of the table, right, with the IFSP meetings, the IEP meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, and I found myself also in that role, almost being like a coach to my, the teams of my kid that were working with my kids, um, asking all the questions and what are you seeing that works? What doesn't work? You know, and then um, 
just last year after, you know, rounding out the year working in the elementary school with mostly autistic support, I just felt like, um, you know, I need to be doing something different. I need to be getting back to this kind of coaching, mentoring, advocacy. What can I do? And so I had been thinking a lot as I've, as I'm in grad school now, um, um, and I've been doing grad school research with the autism center for excellence and learning a lot about that. And I just was like, I want to develop an approach that kind of takes all of those skills together and, um, working with a family, but also being able to be their advocate and having a really good understanding of all the sides of the table and all the multiple layers that go into the IEP and the, the bureaucracy of all of it. And so the joyful connections approach came about, um, in terms of wanting to eliminate that us and them mm-hmm. sort of thing, where it's like, you know, parents on one side of the table and yes. the, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, the IEP presenters on the other side of the table, um, and just bring everybody together to connect, including the child, you know, bring, making sure the child is, is also connecting and participating when they can in the IEP um, process and 504 process. That is wonderful. <laughs> I think, I think Thank a lot you. of us, um, when we have our professional hat on it, you know, we do pivot because of our personal experience. Um, I've mm. seen that myself and with a lot of the um, other colleagues that I refer to. I also think when our children arrive, they say, what do you think you are an expert in? Here, hold mm-hmm. my whatever. <laughs> I always say with my son, hold my boob. <laughs> Uh, he's a big boob monster. Um, he just wanted to say like, oh, you think you know, you know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And while that, of course, can be a big personal struggle, I think it just brings so much more value to what to what we offer families. So it's really nice to sure. hear that you've had a, a similar experience. Um, yeah. So before I get to my next question for you, um, For anyone listening that doesn't really know me and my personal journey, um, the whole reason I'm doing this is because I'm on a prolonged journey with my son, who in the very early ages, I I knew something was going on. I just thought he was a highly sensitive person um, because so am I. So that made sense. Um, He had trouble separating for preschool and it didn't ease up with time and predictability and so on. And I want to keep this long story very short. Um, But we found out early on he had sensory processing differences. Um, He's both a sensory seeker and a sensory avoider. So it's that really fun for parents (laughs) combo of the two (laughs) that requires a very specific sensory diet. Um, What I did not know at that time was that he was going to go on as school you know, increased in complexity and changing rooms and changing teachers and the content. Um, he would go on to have what I now know or know are called executive function deficits. I had no idea we were headed toward a diagnosis of neurodivergence, but we have that now. Um, so really what there's so much I could have you talk about, and I'm sure I'll yeah. have you back again. But what we're planning to focus on today is to first help parents understand what those two, what are sensory processing differences, uh, mm-hmm. disorder, if it's to that degree, what are we talking about when we say executive function? And once we've established that, what is the connection you know, between yes. the two? Yeah. Because if anyone could have put all of this on my radar mm-hmm. earlier, I feel like maybe at age three or five, we could get to the resources and supports that we're now getting at age you know, 13. Um, right. And while I'm grateful for them, our journey did not need to be that prolonged or that grueling <laughs> for, for in yeah. each of us individually and certainly for our family, you know, mm-hmm. collectively. So obviously every episode is important to me, but this one feels like it, it really hits home. Um, yeah. So when we talk about sensory processing full stop or sensory processing mm-hmm. differences, sensory processing disorder, like, can you help us understand what all those things mean? 
Um, I'll certainly try. <laughs> I <laughs> think, but I think I think you are spot on when you say we would probably need a whole nother show or two mm -hmm. to really get into this. So I'm going to try my best to give kind of the surface sensory 101. Perfect. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pretend like nobody's ever heard of this thing before because a lot of us haven't. Right. Um, and and um, I'm gonna go right into the 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 senses. Okay, so we have eight senses. Mm -hmm. We have vision, auditory, olfactory, which is smell, um, gustatory, which is taste. Um, you have tactile, touch, proprioceptive, vestibular. Proprioceptive is your, is your body awareness. Vestibular, which is movement. And then um, another sense called interoception, which is your body's internal awareness of what's going on. Like when you feel like you need to use the bathroom or you're hungry, those kinds of sensations. So when we talk about sensory processing, sensory integration, there's a lot, a lot of different um, theories and terms and a lot of them overlap. Um, I like to think of those eight senses and think about how they interact, how they integrate and help us to learn and adapt and develop when we're thinking about young children. Even as adults, though, we all have sensory processing differences. Mm -hmm. When we look at it um, in the context of children and we look at sensory processing disorder, that's typically when um, the level of difficulty processing one or more senses is interfering with daily functioning. So that's where it becomes, um, we go into that sensory processing disorder piece. And so there's a lot of talk among multiple disciplines, mostly OTs, psychiatrists, psychologists about, okay, is the sensory processing disorder this separate thing? Does it need to be in the DSM-5, right? Like where does this diagnosis fall? Yeah. Because there's so much overlap. Um and, and, and there are children who have sensory processing disorder primarily, and there's no other comorbidity. There's no other diagnosis, but we do know that sensory processing difficulties, the majority of neurodiverse children experience some type of sensory processing difficulty. Okay. So that was one of my clarifying questions. You can mm -hmm. have sensory processing differences alone. But yes. it's also more common to see that sort of under the umbrella of another diagnosis, such as autism or something else. That is what the most recent research points mm -hmm. to. That's what I'll say, right? Because the research on this topic is so huge and ongoing. Sure. Um, the most research is saying, you know, they're looking at, at, at brain differences. Okay, this individual has sensory processing disorder. That's what we've diagnosed them as. And this individual has autism with, you know, sensory processing, obvious differences. And they'll look at the brains and they say, okay, well, this area of the brain, the sensory processing area has similar issues as the child with autism. However, the child with autism has other difficulties and neuro differences in addition mm -hmm. to that. Um, so I think as research and technology grows, we're starting to understand a little bit more about these complexities. And I think it's, really important to think more about the interaction between all of the senses and our, we're going to get into the executive function when okay. we talk about behavior um, and, and what it looks like for each child. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I just want to share an analogy for parents that was really helpful to me when I was first learning about sensory processing. Um, and interestingly enough, I was researching it for a client whose child was having trouble sleeping because that's mm -hmm. what I do. And I saw this checklist and I went, oh my goodness, <laughs> that's my kid. Mm -hmm. uh, as also often happens to us as professionals. So that was, that was a good um, accidental discovery. Uh, but the analogy I heard is that we can think of each of the senses you listed as sort of cups. And for mm -hmm. some of us, our cups are always overflowing. And maybe mm -hmm. it's just one particular sense. Like I cannot handle a lot of auditory input. So if the TV is on and my son is bouncing on a ball as he likes to do, and my husband is trying to convey something to me, I, I, I can almost go into like a fight or flight. Like there's too much yeah. going on around me. So I would think of that as like my cup for auditory input is kind of always over 
flowing. So I'm looking to turn mm-hmm. things down and turn things up. And if I can't control that, it can send me kind of into a tailspin. Whereas my son, <laughs> he loves mm-hmm. auditory input, particularly if it's noise that he's choosing and he's creating, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that we can have different needs in each cup. So maybe we have, uh, you know, a a proprioceptive cup that feels empty. These are our kids that are always spinning, swinging, bouncing, crashing, bumping into you. They need like constant movement, but then another cup that like they need less of that. So that was kind of helpful for me to have in my mind is particularly to understand how he had sort of a combination, some things he Mm -hmm. needed more of, some things Mm -hmm. he needed less of. Um, And then in order to address that, we were first figuring out which cups were always too low and too high and then what could we adjust you know either in advance of him kind of going into a tailspin mm-hmm. or um you know in the moment which i know we'll probably get to so that's a good is that a good way to think of it it's a good way for me it is it is i think i think using any kind of a visual can help right it always kind of helps us um get a clearer picture i i like to think too i have a lot of um, kind of anecdotal stories that I'll explain to parents when when we start to talk about their specific child, and and some children will have difficulties with um, a lot a lot of children that I work with on the spectrum difficulty with olfactory sense smell, um, tactile and auditory. Those are three areas that tend to be hyper responsive, hyper res- hyper um, like you're saying your cup is overflowing right? And so those um, kiddos, they might have a lot of trouble in the cafeteria at school Mm -hmm. eating. Um, And they are, they're so overwhelmed, the smells of these unfamiliar foods in the cafeteria, the sounds in the cafeteria, um, having to sit uh, really close to a peer. Um, And then, but the main concern comes up is, well, they're not eating at school. And they're and the and the parents and family and staff, everyone's worried about nutrition. Yes. So why aren't they eating at school? Well, here this issue has nothing to do with them eating. It's these other senses that are so um, overwhelming to the child. So it really is about um, our ability to assign relevance to all of these sensory inputs we're experiencing. And for someone with sensory processing disorder. Um, everything might feel relevant or nothing might feel relevant. And so it's, it's, it's definitely, I mean, it's such an individualized um, approach, right? Every child, every person has their own kind of set of hyper and hyposensitivities. Um, I happen to be very similar to you with the auditory processing. Mm-hmm. And as you know, we're adults, we learn about, we learn this about ourselves, right? So if I'm, if I want to study, I need it to be completely quiet. Some yeah. people need music. They need yes. music. They need to study in an environment where there's sound. Um, so we learn and we know what we need, right? Yeah. And so we can, and and I know now, like I, I can't tolerate, you know, long concerts. And <laughs> there's a lot of things that, I, that you learn about yourself. But when you're talking about young children um, and you're looking at bathing, teeth brushing, feeding, attending school transitions going on and off the bus, you know, those experiences are so, so sensory rich that um, there's more opportunity to see the behaviors come out and you can kind of tease out what, what is averse to them and what works and for them. That is so important because to use the example of the cafeteria, which was probably one of our early red flags that we didn't know was a red flag. Um, our son wasn't eating when he first spent the full day at school. And of course, at first we assumed like, this is a big adjustment, you know, whatever. And then we chalked it up to like, well, he doesn't like the foods that we're sending. So let's, you know, smaller portions, things he loves, just get the calories in him. And then we said, well, he doesn't know how to open some of the packaging. So let's practice that. And let's ask someone to come, you know, stop by his table and make sure he's okay. Um, and eventually, of course, through a lot of trial and error, <laughs> we did determine that it was about the environment. It was, it didn't matter. It had, we kept on that track of this is a nutritional thing Mm -hmm. or even a dexterity thing. We never Mm -hmm. would have found a solution. And of course, time did help, um, but we ended up sending in noise canceling headphones and getting Mm -hmm. him the ability to sit in an area that was a little, um, calmer. It was also way too fast for him. He's a very slow Mm -hmm. eater. So Mm -hmm. he was anxious about finishing in time to get outside. And then he was like, well, I just won't even start at all. So it's so important to figure out the why behind the what, Mm -hmm. particularly with behaviors or what seem like behaviors. Um, Mm -hmm. And I feel like for 
we lay people, we parents <laughs> that don't have maybe the professional hat, um, that's really hard for us to pick apart. And that's the benefit of sometimes reaching out to someone who can look at it from a non-emotional point of mm -hmm. view and with like just a, a bigger lens <laughs> and more yeah. experience. Um, but I am totally sidetracking. So back to our <laughs> topic at hand. So we have a great definition and understanding now of sensory processing. Before we get to the connection between that and executive function, and I know this is a, also a loaded question, how would you <laughs> briefly define what we're talking about when we say executive functions? I know executive function, it sounds so sophisticated. And, and, and everyone really, has a, lot a different of ways, definition. They, they really do. Um, I, I think overall, when I think of executive function, I think about the ability to self-assess and kind of self-regulate in terms of impulse control, planning, organization, attention, being able to um, really filter out what is relevant and not relevant in our environment and then attend to, the, to that thing is, mm -hmm. is what, how I interpret executive functioning. That's sort of my definition. There are a ton of visuals out there. There's I, that I've seen executive function wheels and it's got all the different things. Yes. Um, but really it comes down, I think primarily with, with pediatric population, especially we're looking at, um, you know, impulse control is a big one. Um, uh, emotional regulation is, is a big one, like with, you know, change, dealing with flexible thinking, mm -hmm. attention, so, you know, in general, coping, those kinds of skills. Does that make sense? It's, yeah, absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> and I think what's maybe hard for parents, you know, a definition that is often given is, well, think of an executive or an executive assistant and like all the tasks that they would need to, you know, to do. And it's, it's that. Um, mm -hmm. But I think we're talking more about, like you said, the self-regulation aspects that are required to plan, initiate, sustain, and complete any task. Mm -hmm. So in a school setting, you know, if a child's struggling academically, it may have so little to do with the actual academic content and more to do with, I can't sit still, I can't pay attention, I can't focus, I can't retain information. Um, yes. So, so yeah, I think your, your definition is, is excellent. Um, so obviously in life, there are executive functions. More importantly, as we enter school, and those mm -hmm. become really, really important. So now that we have a definition of both, how do you see these two things interplaying, sensory mm -hmm. processing and executive function as kids get older, they enter school, school becomes complex, they do independent things like toilet training and asserting themselves and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're, we're definitely not born with executive function. <laughs> so, um, that's definitely a skill that, um, you know, we learn. And, and one of the first ways that you see children learning it is through play. You know, children learn through play, of course, all the time. And when they play, they're using their senses. And so they have a big pile of blocks, you know, and they're using their tactile sense and they're going to take those blocks and what are they doing with them? And, and so to see a child plan something with blocks, I'm going to tower them up. I'm going to bang them together. I'm going to, those are, those are emerging executive functions because they're making right. a plan. They're taking these objects. They're making a plan. So for the child who has difficulty with their tactile sense, with proprioceptive, which is their body awareness, maybe they're just grabbing the blocks and throwing them. Because this, they're just, their senses are craving so much tactile and so much um, proprioceptive input. They're just wanting to bang them, throw them, and that's just what their body needs. So they're not yet able to use those executive functions to then plan out in action with the blocks. Mm -hmm. So that's just an example to, to kind of frame it a little bit differently. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a whole camp out there of, of, of uh, I think it's mostly like the, the psychologists, psychi psychiatrists who are looking at executive function and thinking, well, you know, there's some research that I've read that, well, executive function can override sensory processing. You know, executive function is the thing that 
that controls the sensory processing. And I would, I would challenge that, um, mm. especially for children who have sensory processing disorder, because if there's so much that, that they're trying to integrate and understand through their senses, they're not going to have the opportunity to, to use those executive functions to practice them. So that's where the sensory support and making sure the child's sensory needs are met either through environmental adaptation or through direct sensory treatment um, can help with those executive functions, helping with their planning and organizing. Um, think about getting dressed, right? If you lay out clothes in front of a, a child and mm -hmm. you know get dressed, if they have poor proprioception, poor vestibular integration, they don't understand movement and how to coordinate their body and where their body is in space, they're going to pick up, they're not going to know what to do with those clothes, right? And they're mm -hmm. just going to, and they're going to need assistance. So until we work on that primary sensory processing piece, that's when they can start to do those multi-step tasks, um, daily activities that they need to plan. And from a parent's point of view, this could easily manifest or be perceived as my child gives me such a hard time about getting dressed 100%. in the morning. It's a battle. Yes. It ruins our mornings. I can't take yes. it anymore. I've tried giving yes. them choices. I've tried bribing them. I've tried. And so yes. we instantly go to a place of my child is giving me a hard time. And you'll mm -hmm. hear me say this a lot. <laughs> I think <laughs> we have enough information, you know, in, in the professional world now to say that in children do well when they can. So in the vast majority of cases, mm -hmm. they are having a hard time. They may not even recognize why, but there's almost always a lagging skill or a need that needs to be filled, but they're not necessarily going to be able to get that across. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly right. And I think it's, um, for me, the, the more I work, especially in early intervention and I see, um, the way children learn through their senses. And I just think the more they experience, the more they're touching and feeling and climbing and rolling and, you know, all of these kinds of things that that's helping them to develop those executive functions because they're going to have the awareness of their senses. So, yeah. Well, and going back to, to touch on the override you mentioned, I would, I would think as a non-expert in this area that more often than not, the sensory processing is overriding the ability to, mm -hmm. to access or use. So you could even have decent executive functions, but if your sensory system is dysregulated yes. um, or, or off balance to use a non, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, an easier word. Um, and I think toileting, because my experience lies in um, helping kids with sleep struggles and toilet training struggles, um, that's such a good example that I see on a daily basis and parents get so confused and frustrated. My child yes. knows how to pee and poop. They've been doing it their entire life. So why, mm -hmm. when I try to take it from, you know, in a diaper or pull up in a corner hiding <laughs> to, mm -hmm. hey, come over here, sit down and do it, you know, on this cold hard seat. Um, why are they so terrified? I will often make a joke mm -hmm. that like they act like the toilet is lava, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, or yeah. a tiger chasing them or they get angry and very resistant and very defiant. And again, we're into the power struggles. Um, but you can easily see now that we know more from this conversation, there's so much involved on a sensory level mm -hmm. when we move toward that process. Um, yes. So if they don't like how it smells or how it looks or how hard the seat is or how cold it is or the lack of privacy or the fact that you are kind of directing it now versus before they always directed it themselves, um, there's a yeah. lot that can appear to be fear and resistance, mm -hmm. but in fact, it's, it's probably some unmet nervous system, you know, reaction or, or need, which is tied to it, our senses. Yeah, it may be. And I think that's, um, I think I drive some of the, my parents nuts when I, when they start to talk about potty trading things, because, um, that's not a specific area of expertise for me, but I always look at it from the sensory aspect. And the, one of the first things I'll say is, okay, are they, are their feet flat on the floor? You know, are they, um, do they have difficulty when the toilet flushes? Does that upset them? Do they have, you know, um, what is the temperature like in the bathroom? You know, all of those kinds mm -hmm. of things. And then talking about, you know, there are a lot of kids that will, um, th 
the bowel movement takes a really long time for them to learn. And a lot of it is because when they're going up and they're sitting on a regular potty, their feet are dangling. Maybe they're not form on a surface and just relaxing enough and feeling secure enough. If they have poor proprioception, if they have poor vestibular, you know, there's all kinds of things that can play into why approaching the potty, the toilet, the restroom can be a sensory nightmare for yep. a child. And then of course I mentioned interoception. And that's another oh, yeah. huge thing, right? Which is, am I aware of this urge that I have? And then um, the the delay in the interoception is that, you know, that they're not aware of it till it's happening, mm-hmm. right? It's like, okay. And then they know something's happened, but the ability to anticipate because of that sensation might be yes. delayed. So there's so much that goes into um, to potty training, especially the neurodiverse population, you know? Yes. Um, that's what I was yeah. going to say next, because even if you're not a child isn't struggling on a sensory level, there are executive functions even involved with the process Mm. of potty training. You need to be able to notice that sensation, remember what you're supposed to do when you feel the sensation, um, Mm -hmm. shift your attention from whatever very important thing you're currently engaged in. And we know that in, you know, the the young world, everything is super important. Um, Mm -hmm. And then get yourself to another location, you know, conquer your fear of missing out, all all those things. That's a lot of, we, as adults with our lens, I don't think we stop to think about how many steps are involved with something that on the surface just looks like go to the bathroom. It's Mm -hmm. not that, it's not that big a deal, right? But it can, it can be a very big deal. It can feel like a big deal. So if we see it with something as seemingly small as that, you know, take that to a school building in a classroom setting, lots of other kids, lots of moving mm-hmm. pieces. Um, yeah. It's clear that kids could really, really struggle. Yeah. It's, it's very, um, it, kids, I think you, you really hit on something that's important. It's like, you know, when we look at things through our adult lens, oftentimes we do look at the behaviors, right? And I think there's a lot of talk as well. People go, well, is it sensory or is it behavior? You know, is it behavior or is it sensory? And I always say, well, you can have behavior without sensory processing difficulties, but you cannot have sensory processing difficulties without some sort of behavior. Mm -hmm. So anytime that I am just starting to work with a child, I'll typically go at it from the sensory perspective first and tease that out. Um, Because if there's support that we can offer that's based on sensory processing, that can then impact the behavior. You can do behavior approaches all day long, right? With a kiddo who's having sensory processing difficulties. But Mm -hmm. if those sensory issues are not being addressed, we're not going to see progress or that, or you're going to have to have a one-on-one do an ABA for the rest of, you know, (laughs) their their life. So. Right. um, And if we can start to frame behavior as what it is, which is communication, um, Mm -hmm. then really our goal I think is trying to figure out what is this child trying to communicate Mm -hmm. to us that they maybe can't articulate in any other way because of where their language is or because of how their body's feeling or what is their body trying to, you know, get Mm -hmm. across. Yeah. Um, So we want to get curious either as a parent Mm -hmm. or with the help of a professional. There's usually something that preceded whatever the undesirable behavior is and we can when we can, <laughs> we can get mm-hmm. to the root of that, not just to solve it in the moment, but to hopefully get ahead of those types of behaviors in yes. future instances. Um, okay. Anything else regarding defining executive function that we skipped over? Mm, I don't think so. I do. I do think that, um, when we we talked a little bit about the the sensory integration piece, I would like to just take it a step further, just to think about sure. children who are neurodiverse in in particular. I think it, this can help um, families when they see their children. I think you actually talked a little bit about you know bouncing off the walls and spinning and doing these kinds of behaviors. Oh yes. Um, oh yes. So. Obviously, young children are supposed to be using their bodies in an active way, right? That's why they have playgrounds and we don't. (laughs) So, you know, they love, they love to run and jump and do all the things. Um, So when you see a child though, who in the classroom um, 
is having a particular difficult time, you know, sitting still and they're leaning into surfaces and they're dipping their head upside down or they're just, oftentimes those are the kinds of things where, you know, sit still, sit still, you know, they're, they're being prompted to sit still, to sit still. Um, and what we did with, um, in the district where I worked in is we actually piloted what we called a sensory work program where the OTs got together with the behavioral specialists. And we talked about putting structured um, sensory work. We call it sensory work. A lot of people call it sensory diet, but I think the diet word gets a little tricky. People go, you're eating, what are you doing? So we, um, we use sensory work, which is scheduled small amounts of heavy work, mm -hmm. which is proprioceptive input, vestibular, so movement. Um, and they do that multiple times through the school day. It's not used as a reward. It's not used as a break. It's used as part of the school day. Mm -hmm. So, and we wanted to see, you know, for these kiddos that were having these behavior, quote unquote, um, issues, but were also presenting with some sensory dysregulation symptoms. Let's see if maybe we try this and let's see how it works with their behaviors. We had some great outcomes. We're still using the program. Um, we actually would also have a visual schedule incorporated with that. So the mm -hmm. child would have, you know, and a lot of these kids had one-on-ones. So it's okay, time for your sensory work. And they'd go and they'd have a menu, a visual menu, and they would choose, you know, one, two, three activities. We give them, you know, two proprioceptive, two vestibular. They do a specific number, it's very structured, you know, a specific number of repetitions, a, spe a specific number of, um, you know, or specific positions that they had to do. And they would do those things and go back to class. And, and for some kids, it was twice a day. For some, it was three or four times a day. Um, and, you know, you'll hear in, in sensory, you know, oh, give them movement breaks and, you know, weighted vests and compression mm -hmm. garments. There's a lot of, of wonderful interventions that can, that can work. Um, for, for this program that we just piloted a few years ago, the results were incredible. I mean, it was I like- I only imagine. It was the, the, the students who, and it, and it carries over to home, right? Mm -hmm. Because they look forward to going to school because they know they're going to have these opportunities and they're going to get what their bodies need. Um, and so I guess I can't emphasize that enough that I think in our, um, the way that our education system has evolved over the past 30, 40 years, there's been cutting back on recess and increasing on testing and kids are, have a lot more um, school demands earlier in age and they're in front of screens more often. You know, it makes me think a lot about um, what we're doing to our kids in terms of supporting their sensory processing systems so that they can develop these executive function skills that they need. Yeah, so exactly. So if a parent is hearing this and thinking, well, I have a really sensitive kid. Maybe it's not just normal sensitivity or typical. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's, you know, something more and an intervention could help. Um, so if, if a parent has a child who's struggling with any of the things we talked about today, academics, cafeteria, basic daily functions, sleep and toileting, um, behavior, obviously. Yeah. How would how might a parent know this is just a phase? We just have to power through. Everybody goes through this. This is just their thing. Or like maybe we need to seek professional, at least, you know, assessment, if not intervention. Yeah, that that's a great question. And I 100% say follow your gut. If, mm -hmm. if, if you're a parent and you're, and, and you have your, you know, mom alarm going off or your dad alarm going off and you're like, yeah, I just, this, something's going on here. Speak to your pediatrician, get an occupational therapy evaluation, um, you know, occupational therapy evaluation, psychologist, psychoeducational evaluation. I am a, a huge fan of just earlier is better, right? Like just get, get as much as you can. Find out as much information as you can as early as you can. I 110% um, <laughs> yes. agree with that. And one of my big, I won't say regrets in life, because it has led to lots of great things that we had this journey. But one of my regrets, if I could use that word, is that I didn't, I didn't trust my gut. I was not the squeaky wheel. I, um, I would even defer to professionals. You know, I would add to what you're saying. It, if you get that opinion from whomever, pediatrician, 
the teacher and they don't disagree with your gut, that's okay. Mm -hmm. It's great that they're not worried. That doesn't mean there isn't something that needs to be explored. So when a parent hears, oh, they are just young. Oh, just wait and see. Oh, this is mm -hmm. age related. It will get better with time. Mm -hmm. That is always a possibility, but it's also a strong probability that it won't. And you've lost really important time where development could have been assisted or, you know, everyone's just been frustrated, you know, all along the way. So yes, I'm a big, <laughs> big believer in what you are saying um, and that you, you are the expert on your child because you're seeing so much more than what everyone else is seeing. Yeah. So um, with my son, he had been um, dismissed from early intervention before kindergarten. And I anticipated that there was going to be difficulty with that transition. Meaning, dismissed meaning they were like, he's good to go. Yeah. We have helped yeah. so him. All, he's speech, graduating. <laughs> early child education. What else? And I think he had some OT. Mm -hmm. And so um, he had done really well. Uh, I basically went into the preschool and was like, this is what you need to do with him. Oh, I was they totally, love that, right? <laughs> I was totally that mom. I was 100% that mom. But Here's I will comes. say that. Yeah. But I will say that. Actually, I did have, I, I'll never forget at preschool graduation, his teacher came up to me and she said, you keep advocating for him because it was amazing and it worked. They were ready to kick him out a couple of times. I'm like, no, no, no. He's, you know, he's, he's, he's got a lot in there and he's gifted. We came to find out later, you know, so um, he's, but anyway, so when I, when he was transitioning to kindergarten, I'm like, oh, I got, I just got to reach out to his teacher. And the, like, I just got to put, and so I said, can I request a meeting before the school year started? Um, again, there's that advocate, the coach then. So, I, so we had a meeting. I said, he doesn't currently have any, any related services. I said, but I want you to know. And I looked them in the eye. I said, it is on my radar that mm -hmm. there are some things going on with my son. Do not hesitate. I said, please, if the minute you see something, contact me, I will request a psychoeducational evaluation. I really think that it needs to happen. I was like, so don't, please don't wait too long. October, by October, they were like, okay, yeah. He's, I'm like, okay, great. Let's do this. You know, let's get the full, the full workup. I wanted everybody. And so he had PT, OT, speech, and he did qualify for services. Um, and I love that you framed it as a statement, mm -hmm. not a question. So another thing I would do differently if I could go back is I kept asking the teachers, mm. you know, I, mm. I feel like something's going on, you know, what do you think? What are you seeing? And then I would kind of get poo -pooed. Um, mm. what I hear you saying, as I said, is that you said, uh, here's what I see and here's what I think. And as soon as you can confirm that, <laughs> here's what we're going to do. Now, again, you come from a professional background that made that easier to do and to say, mm -hmm. and not all of us have that advantage. Um, but I think that's another thing that parents can think about is kind of head into it with the confidence of this is, this is a statement, not a, not a question. <laughs> Something well, yeah, and is going on here. <laughs> you know, and I think also knowing my years of experience in the um, public school system as well, I can tell you that, you know, the comfort level of the teachers, you know, they don't mm -hmm. always have a real strong comfort level going to a parent and saying, I have concerns about your child or even agreeing that there are concerns. So you're um, setting that, the tone of that doesn't I'm feel good. This yeah. <laughs> it yeah, it's exactly. So like it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't feel good to them. And they, and they, and they, um, and a lot of them are, you know, that they want to just be strength-based and see the best in the kids and oh, they'll grow out of this. And that's, you know, that's great too. But I think as parents, sometimes we need to like you said, go with your gut and really be, be strong. And that, you know, it, in, and frame it in, I am concerned and I want to formally request an evaluation. Mm. Um, and really just, even just saying that, like I've had, um, clients that I've worked with who have had, like sent me, you know, letters, we're going to send this to the district to, um, ask because they're afraid that they're going to get rejected for the, you know, psychoeducational evaluation. It's like a three page thing and there's quotes and there's all these things. And I'm like, listen, it's like, this is a fabulous amount of information that you can provide to the interventionist when they're evaluating your child. I was like, for right now, you just say the teacher has concerns. We have concerns. We are respectfully requesting an immediate 
psychoeducational evaluation. Like, yes, that's and, it. And I and would sign add, it. <laughs> like, uh, certainly state it verbally from my experience, I would add and follow up in writing. Yes. Um, another one of my major regrets is I didn't know to put anything in writing and by writing, you know, an email will suffice. Um, not, it doesn't have to be snail mail anymore. Uh, my new phrase is if it, if it isn't in writing, it didn't happen. So mm. all those verbal concerns I expressed to teachers did not follow up on uh, in a formal way. I have no, I no recourse, no proof it ever happened. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, to, <laughs> to all of that. Yeah. And, and you know, and I told, and I had told this, this particular family, I said, you know what, but hang on to this, hang on to that letter. Like, this is good stuff. Everything you're reporting about your Absolutely. child, but like, hang on to this because they're, you're going to get a lot of questionnaires, you know, from the interventionists who are going to have checklists and they're going to want you to provide document, feedback. Document. Keep yeah. this and use that information because sometimes it's tricky to recall it all, right? As a parent, oh, you get you get this the standardized checklist, and there's just all these different questions, and and yes. there's so much that, of thinking, and I can't remember, do they or don't they do this? Do they, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so having your own documentation, I think, is is really important too. Yeah, great. So let's say a parent at this point is like, okay, cool. So either for sensory processing or executive function or, you know, any of these things, I would like to explore this. Is an occupational therapist the best place to start? Like what types of professionals are assisting with this? Where should a parent begin? Um, I think, first of all, it, it does depend on age. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're if you have um, a very young child and you're going to go through the intermediate unit in in Pennsylvania, that's how that works. Um, and so you would get an early intervention um, evaluation. And so I think contacting your family doctor, pediatrician um, and contacting the Montgomery County in, or whatever county you're in, whichever county, right? Good, whatever, whatever county you're in, the, the intermediate unit and scheduling a comprehensive evaluation. And I. I am of the, um, I, my thought process is if you can get all of the disciplines to evaluate, right. Rather than just one, because sometimes, okay, well, they're not talking, right. This is my biggest concern is that the child isn't talking. And because that is such a huge concern, you may not notice that there's other things going on, physical, occupational, you know, there's, there's behavioral educational. So I always, um, advise parents like, get them all ask for a multidisciplinary evaluation because that way you're going to have everything evaluated and oftentimes they'll do it in um like a like a forum kind of a setting so all the therapists are there and they can all observe the child and they're all looking you know within their their disciplines and you're going to get more comprehensive information that way and then in in the school setting of course um, the psychoeducational evaluation is going to be the way to go. And um, I also recommend the same, like not just a psychoeducational, but if you have any concerns related to even slight like clumsiness, maybe their grasp on the pencils a little off, get that OT and PT eval too, because other things might come out. You know, the OT might come in to screen the child and say, oh, wow, I'm noticing these things. I'm going to send a sensory processing measure home and send that to the teacher and we're going to get more information. So right. it's great to get it all done because once that process starts and you're getting that psychoeducational evaluation, it's harder to then add on. Um, because yes. then you have to go through the whole permissions process and Absolutely. everything. So, and for any yeah. parent who doesn't know, and this is a, a topic of another one of our episodes and probably many more to come, um, you can get these things covered by the county mm -hmm. or the school. And if for some mm -hmm. reason that isn't happening for you or happening easily enough, um, an advocate can help make that happen, which is of course your other, <laughs> another one of the hats that you wear. So I just like families to know those options are yes. available to them because this can get very um, expensive very quickly. Uh, all yes. right. So we're almost wrapping up, but for this last question, I would love you to take off your consultant mentor advocate hat <laughs> and just put your mom hat back on and think about your own parenting journey. What is one thing that you have learned that you wish that you knew sooner, did sooner, whatever it may be, and you want our listeners to know or think about now? Hmm. I think um, I think there's actually two things, but they kind of interact. Uh, 
the first thing would be uh, don't sweat the small stuff mm. because and this was this is kind of specific to me because I I say I'm a recovering type A person sometimes. Mm, I'm specific <laughs> to both of us. <laughs> So when I would, you know, when my kids were real young and, you know, oh gosh, all my clinical experience and all the structured schedules and visual, all the things and all the tricks that I had. And then all of a sudden there would be a regression, right? A regression in behavior, of sleep. All of a sudden they're not sleeping well. All of a sudden they're, you know, I don't know that they either toileting regression, but eating, like any of those areas. And I would immediately go into, let me go into my troubleshooting, fix this mode, right? Like, why is this happening? How can I fix it? And I would, it would consume me the mental burden of fixing whatever was going on. And then now that my kids are in that tween area, I can look back and go like, oh my gosh, I wasted so much worry and so much time on these things that they just worked through or they were teething or they were just, you know, they could have been a million different things. And so if I could go back, I would probably just give myself a little shake and be like, chill out, woman. <laughs> like, just relax. My uh. my ex-husband would agree with you about me. <laughs> <laughs> to, to put a real personal spin on it, he used to say, yeah. I wish you didn't know any of the things you know from your job because you're making this like you're making yourself crazy over our kid. Um, yeah. And I use the word crazy very, very delicately and lovingly. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> mean it in the nicest way. That is really, wow. Yeah, I can totally, we could talk about that <laughs> forever. And along the same line, I think it helps parents to know that there are these typical um, progressions in develop, mm -hmm. you know, for example, in brain development or physical development that cause what feels like or manifests like a regression in other areas like mood and sleep and uh, eating. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them are even mapped out like in the early years. Uh, I don't think many people have studied it for kids as they get older. I think maybe it's been studied through like one, one and a half. Um, but if you can just know that there is that ebb and flow, and yes. like nothing lasts forever. I mean, not the, the great stuff either in no. most cases, certainly not the bad stuff. And and yeah, that was one thing I learned too. Just like my son is always in some kind of phase. Mm -hmm. And instead of waiting for him to become this easy kid that may be my best friend, Mm -hmm. had, I would just get through the hard stuff and wait for that to become easier. But mm -hmm. I would also be mentally prepared that then something else would start to feel. Mm -hmm. He's just a challenging kid and his challenges kind of play off of my, you know, needs and deficits. It's like a very tough combination. So something was always going to feel really challenging and overwhelming mm -hmm. to me. Um, and just kind of acknowledging that, which goes back to what you're saying, so that you cannot sweat it or not sweat it so hard for so long, I think yeah. is really, really valuable. That's I great. think that, and then the second thing I was going to say is sense of humor. If you have it, <laughs> use it. Holy cow. My, if you don't, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I know. I know. I'll, I will pray for you. you don't, <laughs> but I mean, you really do, especially now in this tween uh, phase of, you know, the back talk and the no, and the da, 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 da. And, I'll, and I'm like, I, I always say like, listen, my background is early intervention. I'm not prepared for this. <laughs> I'm not prepared for all of them talking back to me. Um, yes. but even, you know, there's levels of anxiety. One of my one child has, um, a significant anxiety and every single thing it's like, what's next? When is this going to happen? When is it? And this morning toasting the bagel, you know, it's like, is the bagel done yet? Is it, when, is it going to, is it almost ready? Oh, I'm like, okay. So we are going to the pink concert in next summer. And so hey. one of my ways of coping is I'll sing a pink song, but I'll make some funny lyrics with it. <laughs> so Love. I'll go on, I'm Love like, it. I know you're going to give us an example, right? I know, right? So, so she was just like, you know, what about now? And I'm like, what about now? Is the bagel ready? And I'll start saying, and she's like, will you stop it? You know, like. <laughs> But the then, whole vibe has changed, right? But the whole vibe has changed. And now she's like cracking up. So like we can laugh about, you know, mm. in some scenarios like that when her or when the anxiety is just like through the roof. It's like, okay, let's 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 sing a song about it and make light of this because um it can it can, you know, drive drive you nuts. It's really hard for humor like, and anxiety to to coexist in the same yes. moment. So yes. yeah, that's well, you did two things. I think my last guest did too. I might have to change that question to two things you've learned <laughs> along your way. <laughs> 
but yeah. they were both incredible. Uh, Carrie, this has been so awesome. It was helpful, even for me, which of course I'm doing this podcast on half of a selfish level as well, but I really hope it was helpful for all of our listeners. Um, parents, I will be back soon with more stuff. I wish that I knew sooner. I will, of course, let you know how to find Carrie if you want to seek her out. In the meantime, I leave you with my list of stuff I learned the hardest way. I actually think we touched on almost all of these today, but I will sum it up anyway, as I always do. Accept help when it is offered. Mm -hmm. Ask for it when it isn't. You are the expert on your child. Trust your gut. And the fourth one, be the squeaky wheel. Thank you so mm -hmm. much for listening. And I'll be back soon with more things I wish I knew sooner. <laughs>